In my capacity as manager of coaching for the English Chess Federation, I encounter the problems of the chess player, especially club players and improving youngsters, on a day-to-day -day basis. For the most part, it isn't talent that is lacking. No, these guys just need steering in the right direction. Which brings us to the chess clinic and the DVD that you are now watching. Now we are going to consider everyday games and faults of everyday players. We're going to strip these games out and show what goes wrong. Where a player is strong or weak and what can be done about it. We will show master games, including one or two from my own practice. And we're going to suggest time-saving ways to get better. I hope you enjoy the show. The clinic is now open for business. Now in the second section of the DVD, I want to talk a little bit about um, developing a sense of danger in our own games and about the need to analyse one's own games. In my experience teaching club players, this is precisely um, what the club player doesn't do. They don't take their games home and scrutinise them, subject them to some sort of examination, maybe they stick them on some computer program but that's not really the same as taking out a chessboard and set and looking closely at your own games using your own brain I mean maybe maybe you're too busy to do that or you're tired at the end of a long day okay that's a reasonable um, reasonable excuse if you like but if you really want to approve at chess that's precisely what you have to do and it's the quickest route forward now how many times have we lost a game and we don't really understand why? Or we completely miss the winning move? I'd like to isolate several reasons why I think this happens. Firstly, we don't think of the game of chess as a whole. We don't recognise the opening is linked to the middle game and the middle game is linked to the end game. We make critical decisions in a game which don't take account of the future. This is why I think analysing our own games is absolutely crucial and they really have to be looked at very carefully. When we analyse our games at home, we don't need to spend an enormous amount of time on them but we do need to pick out all the critical moments in the game and make some notes at these times. Not every move in the game of chess is equivalent. Some moves are more important than others and to have a heightened sense of knowledge about when these moments are Cannot help, can't help to improve your own game. So, briefly stated, when could the critical moments be? Well, firstly, important points in the opening. Secondly, moments where tactics predominate. It's my experience that tactical oversights often lead to the majority of defeats in club chess. We should take account of changes in the pawn, pawn structure, where captures were made, where pawns were advanced. We should make an ongoing comparison of the relative safety of the kings. Perhaps we should look at moments in the game when pieces were exchanged. And finally, we should take account of our feelings during a game. How do you feel during a game? Does your mood change as the game goes on? Do you experience highs and lows during a game? Know yourself is a very important motto in life. It's particularly important when you're playing chess. Notes should be simple in nature, honest, diligent and to the point. And so I think you should set this as your aim. Now we're going to look um, at a game here between an American player called Earl Zisma, who comes from Dubuque in Iowa. He's a chess lover. His grade um, is about 1800. He's got a demanding job, so he can't spend as much time as he'd like on the game but obviously like everyone else he wants to improve so we're going to take a look at one of his games now where he was playing a much higher rated player called Chachera who is 400 points ahead of him on the rating list and we're going to try and find out why Earl lost and we're going to use this critical moment theory to to highlight the reasons why Earl lost so I'll just reiterate there's a 400 point rating difference between the two players OK, well, what we have here is basically an English opening. Um, I gathered when I met Earl that this is the, his favourite opening. He's playing his normal stuff. 
there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I would ask Earl honestly, does he really expect to outplay a much stronger player with this very quiet opening? Black is not being put under any pressure in the opening. He's being allowed to develop in comfort and he's under li little, tactic, little tactical or positional pressure. So, for me already, White is setting the scene for his eventual demise by playing quietly like this. However, let's carry on. Okay, White played Bishop G5. And Black decided to play H6, which more or less forces White to surrender the Bishop pair. Alright, Knight comes out to F3. Pawn up to G5, Queen to C2, and Black brought his bishop to G7. And already Black has the better game in my opinion, with a possible kingside pawn storm in the offing, and two nice bishops. And it's pretty clear that White wasn't very comfortable with his position, because he castled on the queen side. Um, most unusual for an English. Although I'm not quite sure what White should do, going back to bishop g7. I mean, a lot of players will simply take it on the nose and cast in this position. However, I think Black can just continue to develop in normal style by um, bringing his knight out to a6 and casting. White can go through with all the typical English ideas, which is basically to play uh, b5 and try and op open up prospects with the bishop on g2. But I much prefer Black's position after the simple knight d4. We come back to this idea of pressure on the opponent. This is very much the modern style. With white, you have to try to find openings which put the opponent on the defensive. And, um, well, Earl ha simply hasn't been able to do that. So, we go back to the game now and cast on the queen side. Black castles on the king side. White win knight d2. Black plays knight a6. And white played h4. Now, just retracting, when I saw this game for the first time, um, my gut feeling told me that unless White took action now on some sort of unusual scale, he can only have problems in this position, thanks to the potential of Black's bishop on g7. You know, a really strong player senses that all the prospects are with Black in this position. So, what is the best chance for White? I think this is one question you have to ask yourself during the game bad positions are inevitable you know you're going to get your fair share of good and bad positions during your chess career when you're in a bad position you have to ask yourself what is my best chance and uh, well that was what I asked myself when I first came to this position and I came up with the strange looking move g4 this to me seemed to be white's only chance and the main idea of this is that when black takes you're going to put a knight on e4 and when black retreats his queen, you're going to go h3. It's an interesting pawn sacrifice, and it's perhaps what a really strong player would have chosen in this position. Opening up the king side at the cost of a pawn. If black takes twice, well, fine. White's got open lines on the king side. He's got a nice square on e4 for his knight. And more importantly, for the time being, he's blunted that dangerous bishop on g7. White has some counterplay in this position without doubt. Now, why did Earl not find this idea? Well, I think it's simply because he's created a difficult position, which is unfamiliar to him. And it seems to me that Earl is not used to attacking, not used to sacrificing, not used to having to take these critical decisions. He's maybe playing players who are weaker than he is and who make mistakes frequently. He seems to be used to be playing... He seems to be used to be playing opponents who make mistakes. He doesn't have to do anything. The mistakes just come. Well, of course, against really strong players, this doesn't happen. You've got to create a mistake. You've got to force a mistake. And so maybe this pawn sacrifice was the best chance. Because if we go back to h4 and the game, blocking up the king side can't really assist uh, White in any way because it's only on the king side that White's going to get any chances at all in this position. And, uh, well, of course, the spectre of e4, uh, sorry, excuse me, of e4 at some moment looms when the queen and bishop come into play against the poor old white king. And Earl follows up h4 with another hesitant move, a3. 
He's obviously afraid of knight b4. But going back, how much of a threat was that? Mind you, I'm not what, sure what white would have played. I mean, maybe king b1 is the best chance in this position. I don't like white's position, whatever he plays. However, I, I just simply think it lacks prospects. So a3 was played anyway, and uh, black went knight c5. White went f3, and black went knight e6. Um, if I was looking at this game from the black side, I would say this is a critical moment for black, because actually I think black should take on f3 in this position. And uh, after bishop takes f3, bishop e6, rook df1, queen d8, I think black is much better in this position, with the queen threatening to emerge on the queen side somewhere, either out to b6 or a5 at some point. I think this would be very dangerous for white, again with the threat of uh, e4 looming. So maybe Chachera missed a trick there, but anyway, knight e6 is not a bad move, because uh, it, it leaves white worrying about the idea of knight d4. All right, e3 was played, fair enough, and g takes f3. Bishop takes f3, queen g6 was played by black. Rook d g1. Okay, well this phase of the game is being played well by black, by white. He's trying to worry black with the idea of g4, but of course this is easy to stop. Black simply has to move his knight. And now black's got three pieces covering the g4 square, so white can't play g4 just yet. All right, b4 was played. Uh, again, not a very happy move. Knight a6. And now we come to another critical moment in the game. In chess, you have to take the best option possible at every stage. And again, um, in my view, white misses the chance to mix things up with a pawn sacrifice. In the game, he played e4. I think he should go g4. Once again, trying to secure the key e4 square uh, for his pieces. Uh, black can't really block the position here with f4. It doesn't make any sense. I think he's got to take this pawn sacrifice. And now bishop e4 gives white some chances. Um, just to give you a sample of play, maybe black goes bishop f5 in this position. Then I'm going h5. I'm taking on f5. And I'm simply going rook g3. And there are some chances here against that isolated pawn on g4. I mean, who knows? Maybe after rook hg1. And if white gets a chance to take on g4, it's black that might be forced on the defensive. Of course, going back to g4, f takes g4, bishop e4, there's no reason for black to exchange off the uh, the light square bishops. Maybe queen e6 is the best move. But there will be still be chances for white in this type of position, after, say, h5. White can think about going after the weak black pawn on g4. At least white's having some fun in this game. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is Earl is playing far too timidly in the face of the huge rating point difference. Naturally, he should be playing almost the exact opposite manner, going for the jugular. This is the only chance. Well, with that observation, we have to return to the game now, knight a6, and we pick up the action with e4. Black played knight c7. If he can, he's en route to d4, which is obviously a fantastic square for the knight. Note that the move b4 by white was pretty undesirable because it gives Black the chance to play a5 and rip open the pawn structure on the queen side. So b4 was a really dodgy move. Okay, queen d1, king h8. Typical move of the strong player. Safety in the king, getting the king off the potentially open g-file and out of range of the light square bishop. White hasn't got a dark square bishop, so Black's king sits rather happily on the dark square h8. Bishop h5 was played. Queen f6, rook f1, queen e7. And now white hastened to get his knight onto the e4 square. d5. The knight's not going to stay there for long. And now white played g4. A rather desperate looking move, but maybe that was what maybe that's all we had, because if we go back, if white goes c takes d5, all he does is open up lines against his own king. So for instance, if g4 now and then knight c5, black just kicks the knight away with b6, protects his d-pawn, and then he can look forward to some action on the c-file, and utilising those potentially two wonderful bishops there, once again against the poor old lonely white king. So back at the game now, white played g4, 
black played bishop d7, knight came to g3, pair of rooks came off, rook f8, and uh, quite a mature decision by black because he knows that um, exchanging pieces doesn't really help white in this position, again thanks to the uh, latent power of that bishop on g7. The bishop's going to be useful in the middle game against the king, but it can also be extremely useful in some sort of end game where uh, the bishop, frankly, is going to tower over the white knights. And now, of course, this position is very unpleasant for white with, with black fully in charge of the initiative. The bishop on h5 on a very weird square and white still has the same problem with his king. So knight f5 was played. I mean, just going back, if white had moved his queen to e1, then I think rook f3 is just a terrific move, putting pressure on the entire white position. So knight f5 was played. Of course, black whipped that off and went e4. And this is, um, this is obviously what black has been aiming to do for quite some time. And it's really the straw that breaks the camel's back. I mean, this is the move which finishes white off in this game. White continues to resist for a few moves, but basically there's no way of uh, restraining black's activity on the dark squares. This long diagonal pressure is simply too strong. All right, bishop g6 is not time to resign just yet. Almost, mind you, because uh, a pawn's going down the drain on the queen side. Another pawn goes west. Knight comes into e6. Bit of tactical interplay to finish. And uh, the final move of the game was he takes d3 check. There's no coming back for white in this position. His king position is um, completely destroyed. So a careful examination of all the critical moments in this game would have provided Earl with the following conclusions. Firstly, his play is in general too passive. He expects a mistake. That's not realistic against a stronger opponent. So that leads me on to point number two. Earl is not creating the type of position in his own games where a mistake is going to be induced against a stronger opponent. So he needs to rethink his opening choices and have specific unorthodox weapons prepared for precisely this scenario. He's playing his normal stuff. His normal stuff will not do against a higher rated player 400 players above him. In a game between two strong players an opening has to create it. That is the very strong message coming out of this game. 